Okay, thank you. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksuru Nilitanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vanchakalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevaca Patita Nam Pavan Hebyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Are you able to see the slideshow? Yes, Maharaj. All right, we're on Chapter 5 of Srimad Bhagavatam, Second Canto. Today we are looking at Chapter 5, The Cause of All Causes. So at the end of chapter 4, uh, we heard Sukadeva Goswami offer his prayers and then he said that he would like to answer the question of Maharaj Parikshit by recounting a meeting between Lord Brahma and Narada Muni. When Narada Muni had put similar questions to Lord Brahma. So, this is the connection between chapter 4 and chapter 5. So, Sukadeva Goswami begins by describing Narada Muni's inquiries to Lord Brahma. And his inquiries were very similar to what Maharaj Parikshit had inquired from Sukadeva Goswami. He wanted to know, you know, who is the cause of the creation and how does the Lord create, who is responsible for everything, for the creation. And after Narada inquires, after Sukadev Goswami is describing, Narada inquires from Brahma and then Brahma, in response to the inquiries of Narada, Brahma begins by describing the greatness of the Personality of Godhead. He glorifies the Supreme Lord. Just like Sukadeva Goswami, when Sukadeva Goswami was asked by Maharaj Parikshit, Sukadeva Goswami began by glorifying the Lord. He offered his prayers in glorification of the Personality of Godhead. So similarly, Brahma also describes the greatness of the Personality of Godhead. So that's from text 9 up to text 17, you have Brahma describing the Lord's greatness. And then text 18 up to 33, we'll hear Lord Brahma describing the process of creation, He's summarizing it. He's going to give a summary of the process of creation. And we want to understand that in summary at least. And then the chapter concludes with a description about how the Lord enters each universe. We'll hear particularly about the Purusha avatars how Mahavishnu is laying in the Kosho Ocean and then from him the universes come out. And then in each universe the Lord expands. He enters into each universe as Garbhodakashayi Vishnu. And then as Garbhodakashayi Vishnu he also expands himself as the Shirodakashayi Vishnu residing in the milk ocean and in the hearts of every living entity and in every atom. So in this way the Lord enters into each universe. Text 34 up to 42. 
All right, so that's the, the description, the main points in this chapter, this fifth chapter. Do you remember chapter four, Dhananjaya Prabhu? Do you remember what happened in chapter four? Yes, Maharaj. After four, Lord uh, described the uh, the process of creation. So there he talks about the process of creation. In chapter four, in chapter four, there was there was no real description of the process of creation. So there, Maharaj uh, uh, first uh, Parikshit accepted the instruction, and then Maharaj inquired about the Srishti Tattva, and then Sukhdev Goswami prayer. So most of part is about the Sukhdev Goswami prayers. Yes, we have the inquiries by Maharaj Parikshit. Maharaj Parikshit wants to know about Srishti Tattva, about the process of creation. And when Sukadeva Goswami was asked to describe the process of creation, then he began by offering prayers. Right? Do you remember any of the prayers? Do you remember that one prayer particularly we discussed? What what was it describing? Maharaj Kirat of Purun different castes were described. Kirathunandra Palinda and uh, Pukasha Kiritahunandra Palinda Pukasha. Yes, go ahead, Maharaji. Uh, Abhi Rashumba Yavana, members of the Khasa races, and even others who were elected to sin for that. Who are the Kiritas? Do you remember? Who are the Kiritas? Uh, tribal. Tribals of India. I thought they were yeah. Africans. Africans, Maharaj. Africa. Yeah. Right. And who's the Kasha? And Maharaj, you mentioned that the uh, Sambar Mango Khasa were the Chinese people. Right. Yes. yes. So all, di all different races, not only Africans and Chinese, all over the globe, different parts of Europe and um, and. Uh, India also, there's so many sinful races, and they all can be delivered by what? By who? Taking shelter of the pure devotees of the Lord. Yes, Prabha Vishnave means the powerful representative of Vishnu. So Prabha Vishnave, by the mercy of the pure devotees, they can be delivered. So that was chapter 4. What was chapter 3 about before that? You remember? Chapter 3, who knows what happened About in... the demi demigod worship? Yes, and what, what was, the con was the conclusion we should worship demigods? No. What was the conclusion? Right. Tivrena Bhakti Yogena Yajeta Purusham. Akama Sarva Kamava Moksha Kama Udaradi. Udaradi. I'm meaning with broad intelligence. Those who have broader intelligence, they will worship the Supreme Lord. After he after Sukadeva Goswami described so many different demigods and how they could give material benefit, then Sukadeva Goswami went on to say that if you have broader intelligence, then you will just worship the Supreme Lord. No need to worship demigods. Right? That was chapter 3. Chapter 2 was the Paramatma. Chapter 1, we heard about the universal form, the impersonal aspect of worship of the Supreme. Right? So chapter 3 was directing us to worship the Supreme Lord. And then after Sukadev Goswami had said this, then we heard about Shunakarishi and his eagerness to hear. And he gave many analogies about hearing. Right? People who don't hear, he really condemned them. He condemned them as being very 
unfortunate souls for not hearing. So that was chapter 3. Then chapter 4 went on to Sukadev uh, Maharaj Parikshit was putting questions that he wanted to understand about creation and who was the creator. He was thinking maybe Brahma was the creator and he wanted to know, is he actually the Supreme? And so he was putting questions to Lord Brahma and then and he asked Sukadeva Goswami to describe about creation and Sukadeva Goswami then offered his prayers. So that in chapter 4, second half of the chapter, were the prayers offered by Sukadeva Goswami. And now in chapter 5, we're going to hear, because Sukadeva Goswami said that the same questions which Maharaj Parikshit was asking Sukadeva Goswami had been asked earlier by Narada Muni to Lord Brahma. So Sukadeva Goswami is describing what happened when Narada Muni approached Brahma? How would Sukadeva Goswami know what happened between Brahma and Narada Muni? Dhanijaya. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So, because uh, uh, this, uh, this whole story has been narrated by Vyasadeva to Sukadeva Goswami, and Vyasadeva in turn heard it from Narada Muni. So from Narada Muni in disciplic succession it came to Vyas, uh, Vyas Muni and Vyas Muni in turn has uh, taught about the whole whole Srimad Bhagavatam to uh, Sukhdev Goswami and that's why Sukhdev Goswami is able to narrate uh, in Bhargava team what Narada Muni has told to Vyas Muni about his own conversation with uh, 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 Brahma. Okay. What's that? Okay. Uh, we'll go ahead. Thank you, Dhananjay. Yes. Okay, here's the first verse. Someone can read for me. Read the Sanskrit and English. Go ahead, Maharaji. Go ahead. Deva Deva Namastestu, Buddha Bhava Napur Baja, Tat Vigyan Hi Yat Gyanam, Atma Tatva Nidarshanam, Sri Narabuni Asram Maji. O chief amongst the demigods, O first one living entity, I beg to offer my respectful obeisances unto you. Please tell me that transcendental knowledge is specifically direct one to the truth of the individual soul and the super soul. Mm. Okay, very nice question coming from Narada Muni to Brahma. He wants to know the truth about the individual soul and the super soul. So what better person to ask about these things particularly about the creation, what better person to ask than Lord Brahma? Because Lord Brahma is described here. He's the firstborn, the firstborn living entity. We always look up to the elder. In the family, the eldest is always given significance and importance. So here's Lord Brahma, the firstborn living entity. And Narada Muni is offering his respects and inquiring from him. All right? No. <laughs> Read to verse 8. All right. but anyway, we have it summarized here. We, 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 let's read the slides before we go. Let's see. Here is a, Narada inquires from Brahma. This is based on text 1 to 8. So you get the synopsis of what is being presented here in these questions. Someone please read. Please describe, sorry. No, no, please not to Narada inquires from Brahma. Narada's sub-question, 1. Please describe factually the symptoms of this manifest world. What is its background? How is it created? How is it conserved? And under whose control is all this being done? Parikshit question one. I beg to know from you 
how the personality of Godhead, by his personal energy, creates these phenomenal universes as they are, which are inconceivable even to the great demigod, Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 4, Verse 6. All right, so we want you to see the comparison, see the relationship between the questions. The Narada Muni's question, he wants to know the symptoms of the world, the manifest world, and how is it created, how is it conserved, and under whose control is all this being done. And Parikshit Maharaj, he, he's asking, he says, how does the personality of Godhead, by his personal energy, create these phenomenal universes, which are inconceivable even to the great demigods? So, you know, some, not exactly the same, but some similarities there. Pariksit also wants to know, how did the creation come about? Okay, let's see, we'll go to the next slide. Right, someone else read, Narada's, go ahead. Narada sub question two, my dear father, what is the source of your knowledge? Under whose protection are you standing? And under whom are you working? What is your real position? Do you alone create all entities with material elements by your personal energy? Parikshit's question second, Kindly describe how the Supreme Lord, who is all-powerful, engages his different energies and different expansions in maintaining and again winding up the phenomenal uh, world in the sporting spirit of a player. All right. So Narada's question, what is the source of your knowledge? Whose protection are you standing under? And who am I, who are, whom are you working? Who are you working for? <laughs> In other words, Narada wants to know what is the actual position of Brahma. And he asks him directly, did you create alone? Did you alone create the element by your personal energy? Because now Narada is, at this point, he's already a liberated soul. Now why would he be asking these questions if he's already a liberated soul? Anyone like to say? Duty Gopi, can you answer? Why is, Mar why is Narada asking these questions if he's already a liberated soul? Maharaj, as you mentioned in the previous, the previous chapter, that uh, why the questions were asked, because again, there will be in Kalyuga, there will be a lot of cheaters who will pose that, you know, they created or they are the Supreme Personality. So, you know, it first point is that it gives a uh, distinction and knowledge to Kalyuga beings uh, about who's the actual creator. And it also, Narad Muni, naturally a devotee wants to glorify the Supreme Lord. So he was aware that Krishna is the creator. So he wanted um, to glorify him, you know, by asking such questions. Okay. Maybe. It, it could also be that Narada is being put into, under the influence of Krishna's Yoga Maya, just like Arjuna became bewildered on the battlefield at Kurukshetra. Arjuna became bewildered, although Arjuna was, you know, he's really a, a great, a liberated soul, a Nitya Siddha, but, but still he was put into illusion on the battlefield. And so similarly, we see Narada and somewhat bewildered, and he's asking these questions for the benefit of everyone. And the example was given, he, he, uh, he's engaging his different energies and different expansions in maintaining and again winding, winding up the phenomenal world in the sporting spirit of a player. What is the example which is given there about he creates and then winds up again the phenomenal world? There's an, a wonderful example in nature of a living entity which creates its own little uh, world and then... It, huh? Spider. 
Yes, a spider, right. The spider and its cobweb. The cobweb is produced from the body of the spider. And then at a certain point, the spider will again wind up the cobweb, bring it back into its own body. Just like the Lord, Mahavishnu is laying in the Kaushal Ocean, the universes come out, and then again he breathes in, and the universes are all brought again back inside his body. So here Prabhupada, or Srimad Bhagavatam describes the sporting spirit of a player. A player. You wind up, you play a game, then you wind up, you finish the game, you know, the game's over. So the same way material world is compared like that to a game. A match. A match is over, wind everything up. Alright, and then? Narada, sub-question sub three, someone read. Yet we are moved to wonder about the existence of someone more powerful than you, and we think of your great austerities in perfect discipline, although your good self is so powerful in the matter of creation. Pariksit's question P. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is one. Whether he alone acts with the modes of material nature or simultaneously expands in many forms or expands consecutively to direct the modes of nature. Hare Krishna. Yes, Srimad Bhagavatam 249. So here Narada's question is about questioning about who is actually the person who is more, is there somebody more powerful than Lord Brahma? And what's the cause of Lord, what's the cause of Narada's question? Why is Narada doubting that Lord Brahma is not the Supreme? Someone can tell me? What is because the... Because you saw because that Brahmaji was meditating on someone. Yes, he saw that Lord Brahma is doing meditation. So he is meditating, must be meditating on someone. And then it's mentioned here, when we think of your great austerities. So you do austerities. Now generally if you're going to do austerities, you should do them for someone, to please someone. Just like you know, we do austerity, we do fasting on Ekadasi, and Gorpunim is coming in a few days. We're going to fast until sunrise, uh, until moonrise. We do it for the pleasure of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, for the pleasure of the Supreme. So we do these uh, different austerities for the pleasure of the Guru and Krishna, so here, Narada is wondering, what, why is Lord Brahma doing austerities? Now, Krishna doesn't need to do any austerities. Krishna doesn't need to fast. So why is Lord Brahma doing it? You, and so this created the doubt in the mind of Lord Brahma, that there must be somebody greater, some object of his meditation, or some person who he wants to please by his austerities. So this he, Narada Muni is asking to Lord Brahma. And similarly Parikshit also had asked like that. He, he asked, does the Lord act alone? Or does he expand himself? Is it his different portions, plenary portions or potencies, what, which are the cause of creation? So this, uh, this way we compare the different questions. So in text 10, uh, Srila Prabhupada gives us example which is quite commonly 
used, commonly known, young children, even at school, they may hear this kind of para, uh, parable about the frog in the well, right? The frog in the well. So, who, is, who, who are we comparing the frogs in the well to? The scientists, Maharaj? Yes, could be scientists. Only scientists. Anybody else? Speculators. Right, mental speculators, gyanis, and mental speculators. All of these people who, who use the ascending process to get knowledge. They use the ascending process. They try to understand everything by their own efforts. They don't like to accept authority. But in Vaishnava philosophy, we learn to accept authority. We hear from someone. We hear and we accept without question. We shouldn't be, shouldn't be challenging. It's not good to challenge an authority. If someone quotes from the scriptures and presents evidence, we should not challenge it, we shouldn't doubt it. But mental speculators and gyanis and scientists, these kind of people, they're, they're, they're very expert in challenging and uh, they don't like to hear. They don't have any faith in scriptural authority. All right, so Prabhupada writes here, A frog residing in the atmosphere and boundary of a well cannot imagine the length and breadth of the gigantic ocean. Such a frog, when informed of the gigantic length and breadth of the ocean, first of all, does not believe that there is such an ocean. And just like speculators and atheists and so on, they won't believe that there's such a thing as the spiritual world. They don't believe even that there's a God, or there's a, a supreme intelligent being behind the creation. And they say, we never saw him, Nobody, why should we believe it? And so similarly, the frog does not believe that there is such a notion. And if someone assures him that factually there is such a thing, the frog then begins to measure it by imagination, by means of pumping its belly as far as possible, with the result that the tiny abdomen of the frog bursts and the poor frog dies without any experience of the actual ocean. So in the same way, materialistic people, atheists, mental speculators, they try to understand, even if they try to understand the spiritual science which we present to them, their senses with their limited senses, they can never understand. We often say, Atashri Krishna Namadi Nabhavad Griham Indriyani, that we cannot understand Krishna by the material senses. How can we understand God? How can we understand the Absolute Truth? It's only possible by His mercy that He can reveal to us. He can reveal himself to us, to the devotee, when he is pleased with him. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, I am never manifest to the foolish and the unintelligent, for them I am covered by my eternal creative potency. But Lord Krishna says, to those who are totally devoted to me with love, 
to those who worship, to those who are constantly devoted to me and worship me with love, to them I give the understanding by which they may come to me. Tesham satita yuktanam bhajitam priti purvikam dadami buddhiyogam tam yenamam upayantite. So Krishna can reveal himself to the devotee when he is pleased with the sincere efforts of the devotee. Not to the jnanis and mental speculators who want to measure everything with their limited senses. So we talk about empirical knowledge. The Krishna conscious philosophy is not for empirical scientists. They want to measure everything. Just like the frog wants to understand the ocean. How can the frog understand the ocean? And similarly, how can these limited materialistic people like yogis and scientists and scholars and jnanis, how can they ever understand the unlimited potency of the Supreme Lord? As I, as I explained yesterday, we have to understand that there is such a thing as achintya shakti, inconceivable potencies. And it's only then that we can begin to understand something of the inconceivable potency of the Supreme Lord. All right, so going ahead, let me see, what have we got here? Brahma describes the greatness of the Lord. Text 19, text 9 up to 17. Lord Brahma had been questioned by Narada Muni. So Lord Brahma begins by first of all describing something of the greatness of the Supreme Lord. The specific answer to Narada's second sub-question, My dear father, what is the source of your knowledge? Under whose protection are you standing? And under whom are you working? What is your real position? Do you alone create all entities with material elements by your personal energy? This is from Srimad Bhagavatam, 5th chapter, text 11 of the second canto. So Brahma says in this verse that his knowledge and creative potency emanate from the Lord as his personal effulgence. So that is one of the questions in the closed book exercises. You're asked the meaning of Swarochisa. Swarochisa, meaning the effulgence which is coming from the Lord. And that effulgence, that Brahma Jyoti, the personal effulgence of the Lord, that is the source of the knowledge and creative potencies which comes from the Lord. The whole creation comes about from the Brahma Jyoti. That Brahma Jyoti is the personal effulgence. And the word is there, Swarochisa. So Brahma says that his knowledge and creative potency by which he does creation, it comes from the Lord as his personal effulgence. That personal effulgence being the Brahma Jyoti. So that's text number 11. Is it clear? Everybody got that? Uh, yes, my Lord. I have a doubt. You have a first doubt? Question, the first, uh, I have a doubt. The first sub-question was text number 2 of this chapter. 2.5.2. The first sub-question. The answer to the first question I have not got. An answer to second question is the text number 11 that answer I have So can you please explain me the question, the, the sub-question 1. Answer there. 
the answer to the first question? Yes, Maharaj. Well, we're going to, you know, you're going to come to it, but you have to be patient, you know. <laughs> it's not, you, you don't get all the answers systematically. Okay, okay, thank you. Let me see, where, let's, let's see, first question. This, describe factually the symptoms of this manifest world. What is its background? How is it created? How is it conserved? This question? Yes, Maharaj, this question. So the symptoms of this manifest world, the three modes of material nature. What is its background? Well, the material nature, it's the material nature, background is the modes of material nature. How is it created? We'll hear. That's going to be told. It's coming. The creation. And how is it conserved? How is it maintained? Under whose control is all this being done? <laughs> yeah, under whose control? It's all under the control of the Supreme Lord. His knowledge and cre so, text eleven. Yes, it's describing the answer to one of the questions. Second sub question: the source of your knowledge. So his knowledge and creative potency come from the Lord, from the personal effulgence, and the personal effulgence comes from the Lord Himself, the Brahma Jyoti. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Brahmano hi pratishtaham. Krishna said, I am the basis of the Brahman. So that Brahman, that Brahma Jyoti, this is coming from the body of Lord Krishna. And from that Brahma Jyoti, Brahma is getting his knowledge and creative potency. There are three different potencies, right? There's the Kriya Shakti, the Jnana Shakti, and the, uh, what is the other one? The Matter, Dravya Shakti. And the three different potencies of the material world for the creation. First of all, the Matter, the Dravya Shakti, and then for activities, Kriya Shakti, and then for intelligent activities, Jnana Shakti. And so, it's different potencies all come from Krishna and they come from Krishna's Brahma Jyoti, the, the Brahman. This whole material world is the manifestation of Brahman. Of course, Shankaracharya, he just preached that. He was fond of saying, Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma, everything is Brahman. This everything is Brahman. But there's a Supreme Brahman, and Shankaracharya didn't emphasize that. But in Bhagavad Gita it says very clearly that there's a Supreme Brahman. Param Brahma, Param Dham, Pavitram Paramam Bhavan. You are the Supreme Brahman. So that point seems to get forgotten in Shankaracharya's preaching of the impersonal philosophy. Okay, we'll go ahead. Here, you, here we're coming to the first question. The specific answer to Narada's principal question. Please tell me that transcendental knowledge which specifically directs one to the truth of the individual soul and the super soul. In this verse, Brahma reveals that his transcendental realization is inspired by the super soul. The truth is that Brahma is created and the Lord is the creator. So Brahma's transcendental realization is inspired by the super soul. The super soul is the expansion of the Supreme Lord. Right? The super soul expands into the heart of all living entities. The super soul is Shirodakashai Vishnu. Also, he's residing on the milk ocean. 
in every universe is a milk ocean, and in that milk ocean, the Sri Rodakashayi Vishnu resides, but he also expands himself into the hearts of all living entities and into the atom. So, Lord Brahma is describing he gets his realization by the help of the Super Soul. From Bhagavad Gita, we also we are also told that. Krishna says in the 15th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Sarvasya Chaham Redisani Visto. Then what? What does he say? Right. Yes. Right. So Krishna Brahma, it's, it's not only true for us, and it's not only true for Arjuna, it's true in the case of Brahma also, that his inspiration, his realization is due to the super soul. So this, this is the position that the living entities are created. The Lord is also a living entity, but he is the creator. All right. The, the, the Upanishad, there's the the the, the uh, Shruti, the verse in the Vedas. It says, uh, uh, among uh, among all living entities is one supreme eternal, and amongst all conscious beings is one supreme conscious being, and that one supreme Lord is providing the needs of everyone. Right? Nityo Nityanam Chaitanas Chaitananam Eko Bahunam Yovidati Kama. Amongst all eternal beings, there's one supreme eternal being. That's a Vedic verse. Sometimes we have to quote Vedic verses. Not everyone will accept the Puranic verses. Anyway, now that's another point. So here, Brahma is inspired by the Lord. He gets a... Right? And then specific answer to Narada's first sub-question. Please describe factually the symptoms of this manifest world. What is, it, what is its background? How is it created? And how is it conserved? And under whose control is all this being done? So 2518, Brahma states, that the symptoms of the material manifest world are three, goodness, passion, and ignorance. And their fundament is the pure spiritual form of the Lord. The creation, maintenance, and destruction of the world are the natural result of his acceptance of the material modes as his energy. The material modes of nature, cre pa goodness, passion and ignorance, they naturally bring about the phases of the creation. Creation is the result of the mode of passion. Maintenance is the result of the mode of goodness, and destruction is the result of the mode of ignorance. And so they're natural results of the modes of nature, the three phases of the creation, creation, maintenance, and destruction. All right, are you seeing how these questions are being answered? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. But the, uh, my doubt is, the first question he asked, the previous slide to this, what you have shown now, the previous slide. Previous uh, slide? Uh, just previous slide, yes. This question, the specific answer to Narada's principal question, and the answer is, is that in this verse, Brahma reveals that his transcendental realization is inspired by the super soul. The truth is that Brahma is created and the Lord is a creator. Uh, Statement, uh, where we mentioned this one, I was on the huh? This statement in this verse, Brahma reveals that a transcendental realization is inspired by the super soul. Uh, this statement, in the, it is referred in which number so uh, Text number what? Oh. 
Oh, I have to look. I don't. You have to give me time to. Ch I'll check it up when we have a break. But it's all authoritative. It's all from the text. Okay. Let's see, where are we? The creation, all right. So the, the material world is described. Then Narada's third sub-question. Yet we are moved to wonder about the existence of someone more powerful than you when we think of your great austerities and perfect discipline. Although your good self is so powerful in the matter of creation. So, this is uh, one of the important points that Brahma want, uh, Narada wants to understand, you know, who is, who is above you, under whose, whose power are you, who are you working for, who, whose direction are you under, who is the personality who you meditate on, and who are you performing your austerities for. So the answer is given there, Srimad Bhagavatam, text 20 of the fifth chapter, second canto. Brahma says that the modes of nature cover the spiritual perception of the living entities. The transcendental Supreme Lord, who is the real controller of all living entities, including Brahma himself, exists beyond those modes. So the modes of nature cover the spiritual perception. We're all covered by maya, right? I quoted the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna said, Naham prakasya sarvatma yoga maya samavrita. I am never manifest to the foolish and unintelligent. For them I am covered by my eternal creative potency, yoga maya. So here maya is covering the spiritual perception of even Lord Brahma. The modes of nature cover, we identify, we become attached to the material world. We have these desires. We are thinking in terms of I am the body, and this is mine. We're caught in this, in the grips of this maya. And it's very difficult to get out. It's very difficult to get free. But if we surrender to Krishna, of course, we can go beyond those modes of nature. All right, so here's some more. What is this? Brahma describes the greatness of the Lord. Text 18 up to 33. Lord Brahma is describing the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Lord Brahma is his servant. He is the, the servant. He is created. He's not the cre... Well, Brahma is doing the secondary creation, but the primary creation is done by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. What Brahma does is simply the secondary part of creation. He's like the engineer, but the initial work of creation is done by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So here's something of Lord Brahma's glorification of the Supreme Lord. The Supreme Lord is pure spiritual form, transcendental to all material qualities. Yet for the sake of the creation of the material world and its maintenance and annihilation, he accepts through his external energy, 
the material modes of nature called goodness, passion and ignorance. So the distinction is made between the internal energy and the external energy. The internal energy being the eternal spiritual energy of the Lord and the external energy referring to the material world and the bodies of the living entities in the material world. We are also the energy of Krishna, right? We are also the Prakriti. We are not Purusha. We are Prakriti. We may be superior Prakriti, but we are still Prakriti. But the Lord Himself, He is the actual Purusha. So for the sake of creation and for its maintenance as well as destruction, the Lord accepts the material nature. He accepts the material nature, but at the same time He is above the modes of nature. He's not under the modes of nature as we are. We are under the modes of nature. We give the example, just like young, young man, young woman, maybe you go home late at night and your father is not pleased with you. And your father says to you, I want you home earlier at night. Right? And you may say to your father, well, look, father, you come home late at night. You know, you're telling me to come home earlier, but you come home late at night. Why are you telling me to come home early? So father will say, it's my house. I can do as I like. You have to do what I say. Right, Diksha? Yes, my Yes, you have to do what the Father says, right? You have to follow Father since it's His house. In the same way, Lord Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, He can do as He likes. He's above the modes of nature. But we're, we're under the modes of nature. If we want to live comfortably in this world, therefore, we have to take shelter of the instructions of the Personality of Godhead. Otherwise, the material nature will simply bring us problems, will simply experience difficulties. Let's just do one more. Oh, that's text 18. Uh, okay, let's take a break before we go on to the creation. We'll come back to that. We'll take a five-minute break. We'll be back in five minutes. This three questions he has asked, one, two, and three, and the answers have been given in the sequence two, one, and three. Sorry again, unmute myself. Yeah. So three questions have been asked, one, two, and three, and the answers have been given in the order two, one, and... Yeah, actually all the questions have been asked in six questions have been asked in verse two only. If you read that verse, 
all the six questions comes in verse 2 and answer for verse uh, question 1 it comes in verse 14 uh, for answer uh, uh, question 2 it comes in 15 16 and then 3 it comes in 21 to 35 that is how it is no glory all the questions are not coming in the verse 2 only first question comes in like yad rupam symptoms of the universe that is what he asked for then yad adhisthanam that is what is its shelter yata srishtam how it is created process of creation so this is uh, the questions uh, just is there in the sloka 2 only no then question some question is coming text 4 then he is speculating Narada. so text 4 it, he is a Narada uh, is speculating you are in, I think you are supreme independent now he himself is trying to speculate and give the answer so initial Narada Muni he asked something and then uh, uh, from third onward he is speculating the answer also and then there are questions are there. Four and take seven. There are two questions. Question marks are there. Text four and text seven. Okay. I have a study again then. No problem. I'll repeat again. Thank you. Yes, yes. Okay, yes. Yeah. Okay, Hare Krishna. Welcome back. So we'll go ahead. We're going to talk about the Lord's creation, how the creation comes about. So here you can see the first uh, aspect of this creation here. The false ego, which is the cause of our presence in the material world. False ego is there, and that false ego is our identification with the material energy where we're thinking we're the proprietor, we're thinking we're the enjoyer. So that false ego is influenced by the modes of nature, goodness, passion and ignorance. So false ego in the mode of ignorance in, is the result of the five elements of the material nature you can see there earth water fire air and ether so you can see how from the mode of ignorance in contact with false ego and the, under the influence of time the material elements come about the five mahabhut is the great elements of the material nature bumer apo nalo vayu right earth water fire air and ether so that's the result of the mode of ignorance and then okay here you can see the relationship 
between the different elements, the five elements, each have their own specific, unique characteristic, right? What we would call tanmatra, right? Tanmatra, the, the sense objects, the sense objects, the, the sense object, the, what is there in ether, the quality of ether is sound. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, I am the sound in ether. So within ether, ether means where there's no air. Within ether, there's nothing but sound can be vibrated within ether. Within ether, within space, you can b vibrate sound. We have to understand that creation comes about from sato to gross. It's not that everything just comes about simultaneously, but there's a very systematic process by which the creation is developed. And it begins from the subtle elements, from the subtlest forms, we come to the grossest elements. So the subtlest form is ether. And within ether, there is sound. Then, with, with ether and sound, there comes about the result with ether and sound, then you will get also the ear for the hearing to perceive sound. Then the next element coming from ether, the next finest element is air. And with air, there's an additional quality as well as sound, there's the quality of touch. We can feel the air. When you put the fan on, you have an electric fan in your room, you can feel the air blowing. You can feel the wind blowing. You can feel the touch of the air. So that quality is there in air in addition to sound. And then from air, we come to fire. And with fire, there is form as well as touch and sound. So fire has a form. You can have a big fire, a little fire, but the fire will have some kind of form. So three qualities are there in fire. And then from fire, you get water. And with water, there is taste. Right? Krishna says, I am the taste in water. So that quality of taste is there in water. And then the next out from water comes about earth. And with earth, then there is also odor, the original fragrance of the earth, the odor. So you can see how very systematic all the elements of the material nature are, how everything is created in a very a systematic uh, manner. Uh, you can see that the, the whole thing, it, it's not just haphazard or random or just to people say something by chance. You can see rather it's a very systematic process by which the whole creation is coming about and the different elements are all identified with each other. And not only are these elements identified, but the different senses relate to each of the elements. Just like sound is detected by the ear, and air is detected by the skin. The skin can perceive the touch of the air. And fire will be detected with the eye you'll be able to see the form of fire. So with fire, you have, we will have vision, and with water, we have a tongue to taste. And for earth, the odor of the earth, we need the nose. So you can see the five different knowledge-acquiring senses, how they relate to the five great elements. The, 
the ear, the skin, the eyes, the tongue, and the nose. The, what we call the Gyan Indriyas, the knowledge acquiring senses. And Srila Prabhupada was reading, or someone, or someone was reading to Srila Prabhupada, they were reading a book called The Aquarian Gospel. It was some kind of Christian book. Anyway, in that book it said that, I think it was the Aquarian Gospel, or maybe it was the Bible, it was simply the Bible, but it said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so it said, in the beginning was the Word. So when Prabhupada heard that, Prabhupada said, yes. He said, that is the Vedic philosophy. In the beginning was sound. In the beginning was the Word. So the first element of creation was ether. Sound was there in the beginning of the creation. So Prabhupada uh, took that from the Bible and he, 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 saw, he saw the relationship between the, what they were saying in the Christian Bible to the Vedic knowledge, that creation comes about from subtle to gross. It's the subtle things which come first, the subtlest elements, ether, the sound. So we give great importance to sound, the hearing process, very important. All right, so we want to understand how the creation comes about. The initial cause of creation is this false ego, and that false ego is influenced by the different modes of nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. So we showed how from the mode of ignorance, false ego in the mode of ignorance, it produces matter the five elements of material nature. Then false ego in the mode of goodness produces knowledge. Particularly the mind is produced from false ego in the mode of goodness. That is called jnana shakti. The mind comes out of the combination of false ego and the mode of goodness. And then false ego and the mode of ignorance. No, false ego and the mode of ignorance, we explained the five elements. A false ego and the mode of goodness produces the mind, and false ego and the mode of passion is producing the senses. We have the Gyan Indriyas and also the Karm Indriyas, the knowledge acquiring senses and the working senses. So the knowledge acquiring senses, we explained their relationship to the different elements of the material nature, the ear, the eye, the tongue, the skin and the nose. And then you have the working senses. You have hands and legs, you have also a voice, and you have a, a generating organ and an a evacuating organ. The evacuating organ, the generating organ, a voice, and hands and legs. These are what we call the karma indriyas or the working senses. So both these groups of senses, so both the jnana indriyas and the karma indriyas, they're due to the false ego in contact with the mode of passion. And all of this is coming from the maha tattva. The maha tattva is the manifest stage of the material nature. The unmanifest stage is called pradhan. When it's unmanifested, it's called pradhan, but when it's manifest, then it becomes a mahatattva. 
Mahatadva means it, the mixture of everything is there. But here we're explaining what is there within the Mahatadva. But Mahatadva is it's like Kichari. You know in Kichari, within Kichari there's rice and there's dal and there's sabji and there's oil and spices. You know it's all there within the Kichari. So the Mahatadva is like that. Everything is mixed up. But we're identifying what is there within this Mahatattva. So the creation is described. You can see there in the corner, we have the picture of Mahavishnu there, how Mahavishnu is residing there on the Kaushyo Ocean. That Kaushyo Ocean, that is also uh, called the, 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 the water of the Mahatattva. The water of the Mahatattva is the Kajyo Ocean or the Karana Dakshayi Ocean. The Kajyo Ocean, Karana, da Karana Dakshayi Vishnu is laying there and sometimes the ocean is called the Karana Dakshayi Ocean. So sometimes it's also called the water of the Mahatattva. The point is that Mahavishnu is laying there in one corner of the creation of the vast spiritual sky, in one corner of the vast spiritual sky, sometimes a cloud will develop, a cloud will manifest in one corner of the spiritual sky. And within that cloud, Mahavishnu will lay down on the causal ocean. On his, uh, on his celestial serpent, Ananta Shesha, he will lay there. And then from his body, he will just simply by his glance, he will produce some Mahatattva. Actually, he said the Kajyo Ocean is spiritual, it's not material. Lord Vishnu is laying there on the Kajyo Ocean, it's not material, it's spiritual. And from his glance comes out the Mahatattva, oh, uh, well, the living entities, the glance of Vishnu, the living entities are impregnated into this Mahatattva. The living entities, along with their karma and also time, they're all impregnated into the Mahatattva or into each universe. Here, this is the initial phase of creation, creating the different elements. But then from the body of Karana Dakshaya Vishnu, the universes will come out. And each of the universes will reside, they'll, they'll float in the causal ocean. So from the causal ocean, then the Lord will expand himself into each universe. And that is the next section of the chapter, the last section of the chapter, how the Lord enters into each universe, which is described in text 34. Thus all the universes remain thousands of eons within the water, the causal ocean, and the Lord of living beings entered in each of them, caused them to feel animated. Very noisy here in Mayapur. <laughs> <laughs> Just now, Gorpunima going on everywhere, all kirtan and <laughs> in India they only know loudspeakers. They don't have sound system. They have just loudspeakers. <laughs> Very loud. All right. So the the Lord enters into each universe. And then, 
with each universe he enters, you can see in the illustration, he enters into each universe, his Garbhodak Shai Vishnu, he lays on the Garbhodak Ocean, and the lotus flower comes from his navel, and Lord Brahma is born, and then with the creation of Brahma, then the secondary part of creation takes place, and he creates the 14 different levels of planetary systems. And you're supposed to remember the 14 different planetary systems in the universe, right? How many do you remember? Right? Bu, Buva, Swa, right? Bu, Buvar, and Swarg, that's heaven. You have earth and Buvar and Swarg. And then above that, then you have Mahaloka and Janaloka. Tapaloka and Satyaloka, and at the bottom, what have you got? Good, yes. Right. And Patal, sorry. Talatal, Sutal, Asatal, yes. All these, the subterranean hellish planets. So, 14 different levels of planetary systems. And uh, from Mahavishnu, or from Garbhodakashai Vishnu, comes Shirodakashai Vishnu, and with the creation of Shirodakashai Vishnu, then uh, the, the Virata Rup comes about, the creation of the, the creation of the universal form. And so there's some discussion there about the universal form. And that you'll come across that again in the third canto, third canto chapter six is also, you also get the universal form mentioned there too. So the universal form, we discussed it earlier in chapter one, that it's a temporary manifestation, it's a material manifestation, actually it's not really spiritual, it's a temporary manifestation. And it comes about with the, with the manifestation, it's the expansion, the Virata Rup is the expansion of Paramatma. And Paramatma means Shirodakashai Vishnu. Shirodakashai Vishnu on the milk ocean is expanded in the hearts of all living entities as Paramatma. And from Paramatma, the expansion is the Virata Rup, the universal form. So with the universal form, then everything is identified, everything in the universe has its place within the universal form. And you need that universal form in order for everything to be fully animated. Without, without the Paramatma, you don't have the universal form and nothing will be animated, nothing can have life. So very important. Then we point out that this section connects to the next chapter. Hare <laughs> Krishna. must be going by. Where, where, where. Anyway, the Purusha Shukta, the next chapter, chapter 6, Purusha Shukta confirmed. This section connects to the next chapter. We're hearing about the Virata Rup, how everything is connected to the Supreme Lord, the Purusha, the one Purusha, the Supreme Lord, behind this whole cosmic manifestation. And that's confirmed in the prayers from the Vedas, the Purusha Shuktas from the Vedas. So the Brahma's conclusion confirms the Purusha Shukta. What Lord Brahma is telling Narada Muni is confirmed in the Vedas.
The pure devotee of the Lord, however, can equally relish the nectar in the form of the profound philosophical discourses and in the form of kissing by the Lord in the rasa dance, as there is no mundane distinction between the two. From 2nd Canto, Chapter 4, Text 24, Purport. So in this way, Srila Prabhupada is encouraging us to appreciate these philosophical discussions. Just as you may be, you may be appreciating the Leela of Krishna in the Rasa dance, as he's kissing the gopis, so you can also appreciate the profound philosophical discourses. There's no distinction between the two. It's not material. All right, so we want to understand what are the aims, what should we have achieved. We explained the flow from chapter 3 to chapter 5. Chapter 3, we heard worship Krishna. Krishna is the Supreme, remember Krishna. And chapter 4 went on to describe Maharaj Pariksha's question. He was eager to hear. Shonaka Rishi in chapter 3 had talked about being eager to hear about Krishna. So Maharaj Parikshit was inspired to ask questions about the creation and to hear about Shristi Tattva. So that in chapter 4 we have Maharaj Parikshit's questions and then Sukadeva Goswami also offers his prayers before replying. And then chapter 5, Sukadeva Goswami begins to reply to the, pray to the questions of Maharaj Pariksha. He's answering the different questions which have been put by Maharaj Pariksha. And he quotes the meeting between Brahma and Narada Muni. How Narada Muni had also questioned Lord Brahma in a similar way. So this is the flow from chapter 3 to chapter 5. A brief overview of chapters 4 and 5. Yeah, we, I think I covered that. The chapter 4 was Maharaj Parishit's questions and then Sukadeva Goswami's prayers. In chapter 5, we have Maharaj Parikshit uh, quoting the meeting, bit, or rather Sukadeva Goswami is describing how Narada Muni met Lord Brahma and he put similar questions to Lord Brahma. And Lord Brahma began first of all by describing the greatness of the Supreme Lord and then he went on to describe also the process of creation. He gave a brief summary of the process of how the Lord creates. So this is chapter 5. And then summarize the description of creation. We showed that how from the different false ego and the different modes the creation comes about. False ego in the mode of ignorance produces what? What is the result? False ego five in the elements. mode of ignorance? Five elements. The five elements, yeah, okay. right. And then false ego in the mode of goodness produces? Mind and knowledge. The mind, right. Where does the intelligence come from? Passion. Goodness. goodness. No. Passion. Yes. Yes. Now, the actually, the tendency is to think that intelligence must also come from the mode of goodness. But no. It's pointed out, intelligence comes out from false ego with the mode of passion. Now, that's a surprise to most of us when we hear that. Now, there is a quote. We did find a quote on this. 
there was a quotation from Ayurvedic source where they described that false ego in the mode of goodness is the result of the mind because from the mind comes desire. We have desires coming from the mind. But false ego with the mode of passion produces intelligence because with intelligence we plan. We plan for our sense gratification. We're always think we're making plans, how I'm going to enjoy, what I'm going to do for my sense pleasures. So that's the mode of passion. The mind is more spontaneous, it's not so much planning there, it's just desires. Desires are there in the mind, so that's the mode of goodness. So watch out for that, bring that to your attention, the description of the creation. And the three Purushas, of course, Karana, Dakashai, Vishnu is laying on the Kaushal Ocean, which is the, uh, there's like a cloudy region in the in this whole Brahma Jyoti, and that cloudy region, that is the Kaushal Ocean, which is becomes the water of the Mahatattva. The unmanifest stage of the Mahatattva is called the Pradhan. And when it becomes manifest, then it's known as the Mahatattva. And the Mahatattva is a, the amal, um, amalgamation of all the different elements of the creation. Everything is there within the Mahatattva. So from the Mahatattva, the different elements of creation come about. And then uh, Mahavishnu expands. The universes come out from his body and Mahavishnu expands into each universe as Garbhodakashai Vishnu and then Garbhodakashai Vishnu expands as Shirodakashai Vishnu laying on the milk ocean which is in each universe. And Shirodakashai Vishnu is also expanded into the hearts of all living entities and even into the atom. So this is the summary of the creation. And then there's a point of personal application, and this is related to the previous chapter, that Vaishnavas must be keenly interested in his pastimes as a Purusha avatar. We should learn Srishti Tattva. It's, it's important. So we will see the creation discussed several times in this uh, third canto particularly. You'll find chapter 26 of the third canto, Kapila Shiksha, the whole chapter is on creation. And it's also going to come up earlier in the third canto and we'll have it again in the second canto. So. It's important for us, it, it's stressed so much, we have to appreciate, we have to understand how this whole creation comes about. Okay, then we did discuss something about Prabhupada's statements in relation to mood and mission. Prabhupada had written, the leadership of world affairs is entrusted to the devotees of the Lord. If the leadership isn't the Prabhupada said it would be good for the world that if we have a good devotee leading world affairs it can certainly help to transform the world situation to make the world peaceful and make people happier and they can achieve the goal of life so that is important the so-called leaders of the world they're all simply thinking about economic development and sense gratification and they never have a thought of liberation. So we need leaders who can properly direct the affairs of the world to a higher goal. And we hope that at some point in the future there will be devotees of the Lord in leadership positions. And then 
also in that same purport of the fourth chapter, text number 18, that a Vaishnava can accept bona fide disciples from any part of the world without any consideration of caste and creed. There's no consideration of caste and creed, but there is consideration of qualification. We can accept disciples if they're properly qualified, meaning they strictly follow regulative principles. They're strictly chanting 16 rounds. They, they come up to the standards required for initiation. That's important. We don't just simply want to have followers who don't have any rules or regulations, who don't take any, any interest in coming up to any kind of standard. They just simply want to have a guru, but they don't want the discipline of the guru. Then that is useless. You could have millions of followers, but if none of them are following the principles, then it's all useless. So the disciples must be bona fide. They must be qualified. I mean, they must practice seriously. They must be willing to hear. That's important. We say, better one moon than millions of stars. Better to have one good disciple than millions of useless people who don't practice. One moon is better than millions of stars. Preaching application. We explained the statement, Lord Jesus Christ and Prophet Muhammad, two powerful devotees of the Lord, have done tremendous service on behalf of the Lord. Their service was to deliver some God consciousness to people. That they preached in countries where people were very, were, 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 were quite uncivilized and barbaric. Lord Jesus Christ was preaching in the desert. There was nothing to eat. And that was why they simply had bread and, and fish, because there was nothing else to eat. They were in the desert. And so their condition was very, very, very economically deprived. It was not a prosperous situation. People were not well cared for. They were not well situated materially. But Lord Jesus preached to them, and similarly Prophet Muhammad, that he was preaching in parts of, a part of the world where people were not very cultured or civilized, but they gave them God consciousness. So it's a great credit to them. Just like we glorify Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva is glorified because he preaches to people in the mode of ignorance. So that's a great service on behalf of the Lord to deliver people from the mode of ignorance. So we have to appreciate that mode of these great devotees, powerful devotees. Right? We said, Prabhavishnave Namaha powerful devotees. They've done great service. And then today we heard also the frog in the well analogy. That some people, that some scientists and jnanis and mental speculators, they're like frogs in the well. As the frog in the well cannot understand the ocean, so these mental speculators and jnanis and scientists, they are unable to understand the inconceivable potency of the Supreme Lord. How there is a creator, a supreme intelligent being behind the universe. But they're in their own little well. They cannot understand that there is such a thing as a creator as a supreme intelligent being behind the universe. 
So this is the frog in the well analogy. All right, so these are the main points from the last two lessons. Are there any questions? Anyone has any question? So you have an exam, you have your exam, they have the, you have your closed book exam next week. Oh, here's a hand up. Yes, Mariji. Diksha, is it? Yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you so much for the class. Maharaj, I wanted to ask, like when you were explaining the material elements and then uh, false ego in the mode of ignorance, goodness and passion. So Maharaj, what, what was the starting of it? Like how did we enter into this, like into Mahat Tattva? How did we enter into it? Cause was false ego, our forgetfulness of Krishna. We became influenced by false ego. We were thinking ourselves to be the proprietor, to be the enjoyer, to be the controller. We were thinking in terms of I am the body and this is mine. This, so this materialistic conception of life was the beginning of our contact with the material energy and the modes of nature. Yes, thank you, Maharaj. And Maharaj, like when we were, uh, this, when we entered in the shlokas 18 to 33, Brahma describes the greatness of the Lord. Then I wanted to ask like, what, what uh, particular statement did Brahma make that uh, the false ego was started to explain in this Bhagavatam chapter. I understood that um, we contacted the material elements due to our false ego. I understood this, but how did how did the flow of chapter go? And how did the false ego start when Brahma was describing the greatness of the Lord? Well, we'll, we'll come to that gradually in the course of this second canto. Brahma has not finished. He's going to continue in the next chapter. We'll hear more from him. He made the distinction between the Lord and the living entity. Now that was there. I think text 11 and text 12 you'll see the distinction. The text 11 describes the Supreme Lord and text 12 describes the living entity. Remember that we are the living entities, we are not the Lord. So we are marginal potency. So as marginal potency we have that tendency to fall under the material energy. We are always the servant. We're always controlled. But we want to try to be the controller. So when does that come about? Well, that comes about just simply by forgetfulness of Krishna. As soon as we forget Krishna, then it mean, it's like it's like that question which always comes up, how did we come into the material world? You know, we always we always have that a $64 million question about how did the living entity fall into the material world. So Srila Prabhupada quoted Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati's reply in this matter about the crow and the tall fruit, that the fruit falls from the tree. So the people argue, how did the fruit fall? And one person said, well the fruit fell because it was ripe. And someone else said, no, the fruit fell because the crow landed on the tree and it caused the fruit to fall off the tree. But somebody else comes along, they simply pick up the fruit and they eat the fruit. So the point is, why should you spend so much time speculating about how you got here? You want to understand the easiest thing 
the easiest thing to understand is how to get out. The most difficult thing to understand is how we got here, how we became entangled here in this world. But understand that we are Prakriti by nature. Bhagavad Gita says, right, Apariyamitas Tvanyam Prakritim Vidime Param Jiva Bhuta Mahabaho Yeyidam Daryate Jagat. That we are thinking this world is for our own enjoyment. And because we are thinking this world is for us to enjoy, then uh, later on in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna will say, um, Mami Vamsa Jiva Loke, Jiva Bhuta Sanatana, Manasha Stani Indriyani, Prakriti Stani Karshati. That's why we get so many troubles. We're struggling with the Prakriti. Prakriti Stani Karshati. We're struggling with the material nature because we are trying to dominate, we're trying to exploit the material nature. That is our conditioned nature because we are conditioned souls. You want to understand how did we become conditioned? That is the big question. How did we fall into this material world? That is something which, which is uh, difficult for me to answer, you know. The Acharyas himself, they don't give us that answer. They don't tell us exactly how we fell into that conditioned nature. But we did hear from Srila Prabhupada that once we were with Krishna, but somehow we have come here to this world. Now we should be concerned how to go back to Krishna, how to get out from this world. So don't try to understand the most difficult thing, which is how we got here. But try to understand how we can get out, which is really the easiest thing to understand. Just simply by chanting and engaging in devotional service, then we can get out from this material world. You understand? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you so much, Hare Krishna Maharaj. All right, any other questions? I do have a question. Yes. The intelligence part, all ego, and in connection with passion, that comes intelligence. Uh, I'm not hearing you, Prabhu. I'm not hearing you. Can you speak clearly? Speak again. All ego. Am I audible to this? All right. Go ahead. Try. Your voice is breaking. All ego. Yeah. False ego plus goodness that gives mind. The false ego plus passion that gives intelligence. So can you please clear this uh, my doubt? Uh, the mind and the intelligence should be coming in the uh, goodness mode. Well, I did try to explain to you about the mind coming from the mode of goodness and the intelligence from the mode of passion. I did explain that point. You didn't hear it? I, did, I could not understand, Maharaj. I could not understand. Well, I was giving a quote. A, it's a quote from actually an Ayurvedic reference where it explains that intelligence is coming out of the mode of passion because with intelligence we make plans. We make plans for our sense gratification. We make plans to enjoy the material world. So this plan making, this business of plan making, this is the mode of passion. But the mind simply desires. Without planning, the mind has desire. So desire is more of the mode of goodness. That is how it's ex how we explain, according to this reference from Ayurvedic Shastra.
So the mind, the mind is not active in plan making, it simply desires, just a desire in the mind. But the, when the intelligence comes along and starts to plan, then this is the influence of the mode of passion. So we have to hear these things. If you hear, you know, we have to accept the authority. These, these points are made in the scriptures. We can't start arguing with it. And, and we have to understand how to support what is said in the scriptures. So I'm trying to give you evidence to support this statement of the Shastra. Is it all right? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. Okay. So then you're going to have, you'll have the close book test on Friday, and then on Saturday we'll have class. We'll go on to the next unit, chapter number six, the Purusha Shukta Confirmed. These purports in the second canto are quite difficult reading. His Holiness Jayadweda Swami was the editor and Prabhupada told him, Srila Prabhupada told him, he said, don't try to edit my purports. He said, just leave them as they are. He said, don't try to do too much editing on these purports. He said, just leave them. Just, you can correct some spelling mistakes or what. But don't do a big major editing job on them. Leave them as they are. So Jayadvira Swami did that. So understand this is Prabhupada's own realizations, his own words which are coming there in these purports. So it's very nice to read them. Yes. I have a question, can I ask Maharaj? Yeah, please. Uh, Maharaj, do all the Purusha Vataras uh, lie on Ananda Shesha? Because uh, in um, Bhagavad Gita, uh, chapter 11, verse number 15, in Burpat, it is mentioned that uh, Garbhodaksha Vishnu lies on the snake bed called Vasuki. In text, in the 11th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, it mentions that is it the 11th chapter? 11 chapter, verse number 15, Purpur. What does it mention? It, it reads like this, uh, that uh, the Garbhodaksha Vishnu lies in the lower regions of the universe. The snake bed is called Vasuki. There are also other snakes known as Vasuki. Yeah, that much is mentioned about the snake bed. So your point is why is it not an Antashesha? Yes. I don't know myself. I don't have an answer for this. We have to have to look into this, try to find out. I, they actually specifically said he's laying on Vashuki, yeah? Yes, that I just mentioned. Text number seventeen. Text number fifteen. Chapter 11, text 15. Can you read it? Is it in the, in the verse or in the purport? In the purport. In the purport. In the purport? Yes. Oh, well, if it's in the purport. Well, did you check in the purports of the Acharyas? No, my I did not check. Well, sometimes in these situations it's good to read what the Acharyas, particularly Baladeva and Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, read their purports to the same verse and see what they say. Now usually Prabhupada will follow whatever these acharyas say. Okay. But something like that, it's very good to check up on that. You just, do you, do you have the acharyas commentaries with you? Anyway, uh, you can get them online. You can get okay. Bhagavad Gita purports by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur 
and also by Baladeva Jibhusan. You check their commentaries and see what they say in relation to that verse. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. All right, so then we'll meet next Saturday. So I hope you have a good Gaur Purnima. Wish you all happy Gaur Purnima. Take care. I hope to see you next Saturday. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you. Gaur Bhakti Vrinda Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Maharaj.